Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic Sea Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. Although industry would like the public to continue to believe that neonicotinoids are not a major environmental problem, they have now shown up in the Great Lakes region. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about this recent study, as well as other news about the impact of neonicotinoids. First, I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. We're having a nice warm day. It's going to be in the high 60s, and the bees are flying, and they're actually bringing in a little pollen from some of the early trees. Well, here in New York, every other day it seems as though we're getting a nor'easter, so I'm not really too sure what to make of it or how that's going to impact the beekeepers in this region, but it remains to be seen. Yeah, we can uh, have snowstorms off and on all the way into May sometimes, but uh, spring is coming. Uh, Things are looking good. One of these days we'll get to spring. Let's hope. Yeah. Today's topic is the impact of neonicotinoids in the Great Lakes region. I'd like to begin by talking about what we know to be true about this region. The Great Lakes region of North America is a bi-national Canadian-American region that includes portions of the eight United States consisting of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, as well as the Canadian province of Ontario. The crops that are typically grown in this region are corn, soybeans, hay crops, and also this region produces 15% of America's dairy products. So it's a very it's a very productive region which also invites industry to use these chemicals. So it would make sense that neonicotinoids would be found in this particular area. They assessed 10 different watersheds feeding into the Great Lakes chain and they were in Wisconsin, Michigan, all along the Great Lakes chain and what they found was that the neonicotinoids were very common and peaked in the spring and summer but could be found in some cases year-round and found the highest samples in drainages that were agricultural or urbanized. So this is a just further confirmation of how widespread and insidious the environmental poisoning has been with these neonicotinoids. This study shows that the most toxic and the most widely spread used neonicotinoids were present and they were found repeatedly. I puzzled a little bit over USGS's taken an interest in this and they seem to be coming at it from the perspective of water quality and their concern not only about the pollinators but about the uh, aquatic organisms that form the basis for the food chain for many many species they uh, have been on top of these questions for quite some time they did a, a study here in northeastern Colorado within about 40 miles from where I live and they were assessing the levels of the neonicotinoids in wild bees in in northeastern Colorado, primarily wheat fields and native grassland. And they found the neonicotinoids both in the in the agricultural areas and in the in the uh, grasslands as well. And they were all the bad actors, and I'll just read the list from their their earlier report. 
Samples included insecticides thiamethoxin, which is a neonicotinoid, bifenthrin, which is the one that we had the last major bee kill with here in Boulder County, clothianidin, uh, that's the one that was the uh, subject of the leak memo. Chlorpyrifos, and that's the one that's been in the news in the in the past few months because it's uh, it it is toxic to children, causes all kinds of uh, problems for children, and yet Pruitt and the EPA have uh, authorized its continued use. Next one was imidacloprid. That was the first neonicotinoid released in probably 1994. And then, uh, actually, fipronil, a, f a fungicide that is implicated in severe bee damage, and especially when in combination with the neonicotinoids. So this is the whole list of, of bad actors. And what I find curious is that you wouldn't think of wheat as being a heavy source of pesticides, but apparently the wheat fields are, and these I don't know where else these would originate because corn would be quite a ways off from where they, they did their samples. In any event, the USGS has been on top of these questions for quite some time, and the Great Lakes study is their most recent. It's interesting that the USGS has uh, pursued these questions quite, quite vigorously, and yet the EPA and the USDA have remained largely silent. They don't want to look. They don't want you and me to know what the level of this poisoning is because they've been a party to the decisions that have brought on this environmental disaster and they don't want to open that Pandora's box. Do we have any idea if Canada's regulatory agency is working with them or has done any similar type of analysis, so on and so forth? I came across a study the other day, and I don't know the details, but in, in reading some of these other things, I came across a study that is being conducted in Canada in some of the watersheds that feed into the Great Lakes from the north. So there's a parallel effort, it appears, in Canada to assess the contamination of these uh, watersheds. Last week we touched upon the fact that New York has evidence of imidacloprid, I do believe, yes. in the waters on Long Island. Just how many regions have we, if you can recall, have we talked about where they have found neonicotinoids in the water? Well, we found it right here in Boulder, in the city of Boulder, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, Santa Barbara comes to mind. I think we found it in Iowa. The, the reality is we're finding these chemicals, this family of chemicals, almost anywhere that we look for them. And, and that's the curious part, because the EPA has very carefully avoided looking. We need to look at the EPA more closely. Well, you would think that this would be a matter of national security, especially since this is affecting the water that we drink, the water that we need to live. Not to mention the fact that the water that is used to grow our crops, which are then exported. I wonder how this is going to impact trade. Good question. I don't know. Good question. Wasn't it true that China refused to allow the exportation of some of our agricultural crops, or was it any of the genetically modified crops? It was, uh, it was glyphosate, I think, that was the cause for concern from China. But they refused to accept any exported crops from the United States. Yes, because of the, I think glyphosate was the question, if it was contaminated with glyphosate. And you take a look at China, especially when you think about what was shown to us in the film More Than Honey by Marcus Eimhoff, in which you could see that they have to hand pollinate because the environment is so toxic that 
honeybees can't even thrive there. So it just makes you wonder if China is saying, no, we don't want this. What uh, next? Don't know. These are interesting times and challenging. Which brings me to a very disturbing video clip that was filmed back in the 1950s, I do believe. Graham White was kind enough to circulate it, and it shows children being sprayed with DDT. And some of the scenes in this video clip are just so disturbing, especially looking back to what we now know about the impact of DDT. I remember that. And uh, I remember it was uh, in the late 40s after the war. I would have been uh, seven or eight. And usually it would be an old army jeep that uh, some of the locals had uh, put into service. And there would be a fogger on the back in the back of the jeep. And they would drive through the neighborhoods. And they would fog the neighborhoods. And the kids frequently would play hide and seek in the in the in the mist and uh, at that time in fairness we did it with some level of ignorance but uh, if, if that were to occur today you know ultimately a DDT was banned by the EPA in 1972 in large part because of the uh, the book by Rachel Carson in 19 1972 1962, Rachel Carson, 1962, Silent Spring. And in 1972, the EPA banned DDT. Now, we face similar problems, perhaps more damaging with the neonicotinoid family. And were DDT to be an issue today, what the EPA would be doing would be ignoring the science and running interference for the chemical companies. It wouldn't be have it wouldn't be banning DDT. We've seen a complete reversal of the D EPA and its responsibilities in the way it carries its uh, out its responsibilities. It's it's now just an extension of the chemical industry. It speaks for the chemical industry, and much of the management apparently has been corrupted by people who whose career path was in the chemical industry. Well, it'll be interesting to see if Canada does anything about this because Canada grows quite a bit of rice. I'm not sure how wide the region is as far as where the rice is grown, but you know, you grow rice in these swamplands and the crop itself is dependent upon the water. So it makes you wonder, okay, well, what are they doing about it? But we do know from previous talks to Tibor Sabo. That there, are parts, there are parts of Canada that uh, grow corn, and corn and soybeans are probably the leading culprits here in the United States and in much of the, uh, much of the world. Um, but as I've said previously, this is not agronomy. This is marketing, and you can rest assured that the chemical companies will find as many crops as they possibly can to increase the marketing of their products. So rice would be one. California several years ago approved the seed coating of clothianidin on rice. Now think about that for a minute. This is a, is a chemical that is water soluble, has a long, long half-life, migrates readily with the groundwater, what what worse application could you think of than to introduce it on a crop that spends half its life in water? Direct pollution of the water. Well, think about this how many people are dependent upon rice as a staple for their diet. Think about it from that perspective. That's really scary because there are a number of different cultures that depend upon rice as their main food. Well, I don't know what the level of contamination of the rice itself is with these neonicotinoids, and uh, and I don't know if there's been any research to determine whether there are health questions or not. But what is obvious is that this, as a seed coating, clothianidin, one of the major neonicotinoids, is being introduced directly into the water system. This is the EPA. These are the regulators that you and I are depending upon to protect us 
against these this kind of poisoning. Well, Tom, I doubt that there's going to be a video of the applications being administered today, 30 to 50 years from now, because I don't think we're going to be around. I really do believe that our species is headed for extinction just based upon the impact of this widespread use of these chemicals. They're the most profitable, and it's not like they're just using them in, in a small amount because of extreme circumstances. They're basically dumping them because the more that they can dump, the more money that they can make, and that's well, the sad reality. That's the crux of the issue, and we've focused on the insecticides because that's the thing that most directly affects me, but this is a sickness, and the sickness is profit at any cost, profit with almost complete disregard for the consequences. If it makes money, the system will rationalize doing it. And we're seeing that in all aspects of our culture. Pesticides are a part of that. The fact that it kills adults, that it kills children, that it destroys the environment, that it may jeopardize the basis of the food system, ultimately may jeopardize us as a species, all of that's irrelevant. All of that is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is profit. Now, I'm not against profit. But I think that we have to apply some sanity to what's going on, and the system is completely out of control. It's out of our control. If you think about what they're doing, not just dumping all these chemicals agriculturally, but the results or the consequences of the impact of these chemicals. Uh, for example, I just finished an interview with Miriam Hanane from honeycolony.com and and for those of you that know her from Vanishing in the Bees Miriam has has lupus and fibromyalgia and she said several times she was exposed to pesticides while filming Vanishing in the Bees and look at her health now and so we don't know what the consequences are and as I said I don't think that somebody's going to be around 50 years from now showing videotape of the applications as they're being used today. So it remains to be seen what the, what the impact will be and how the, that will be handled. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. As always, to be continued. And thank you to you and to our listeners. I, you know, I hope we have a wide range of people out there listening to what we have to say. We may not always be absolutely right, but uh, we're trying to give some thought to these questions. They're very, very serious questions, and the further we go, the more serious they seem to be. Folks, if you have any questions for us, please write to us at questions at theorganicview.com. We would especially like to hear from beekeepers as well as people who have suffered from health complications because of pesticide exposure. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Tune in each week as Tom and I continue the discussion about the impact of neonicotinoids on this special series called the Neonicotinoid View. 